here. All right, y'all. Well, good evening. Uh, welcome back. Uh, if you have a Bible with you, you might want to open it up to the book of Daniel, chapter 2. And as you know, um, last night we started uh, teaching on the subject of the kingdom. We're basically moving in here to chapter 5 of the book that I wrote on the coming kingdom. So this particular uh, lesson, the contents of which you can find in chapter 5 of the book, The Coming Kingdom, but just to kind of backtrack, um, what we're doing is we're tracing the doctrine of the kingdom through the Bible. So we started with the Garden of Eden, you remember, number one. And that's where the office of theocratic administrator was established, where God the Father des desired to rule through a man along with his wife, and the two of them would govern creation for God. So they were what we call uh, theocratic administrators, those who govern for God. Yeah, Daniel 2, Daniel two I'm sorry. And Genesis 3, that's what was lost. Uh, that structure was lost when our forebears began to listen to the animal kingdom, uh, in particular a talking snake, rather than ruling the animal kingdom for God. So at that point, the office of theocratic administrator is lost, and then the point of the Bible is how is that going to be restored? And so we move from there to number two, which was the covenant that God made with Abraham. We traced that out last night, and we, we show that that's really where the intention of God is expressed for the very first time concerning his desire to bring the kingdom back to the earth. And it's expressed through the covenant he made with Abraham and its promises of land, seed, and blessing, you'll recall. And those three promises were traced through the various sub-covenants. The land covenant, the Davidic covenant and the new covenant. And so we worked our way through that. And we saw that the, in the Abrahamic covenant, God gave to Israel ownership of those blessings. Uh, those blessings will always be Israel's. Nothing can take them away. Because the covenant that he made with Abraham is unconditional. And then from there, and I'm trying to present these, the, key, the high points in the Bible in the order that God revealed them in. Because unless you can see the order God revealed them in, you can't really grasp the totality of what God is revealing concerning the kingdom. So most people, when they talk about the kingdom, which is what this class is about, they start with the New Testament. And that's no, really no way to do it. Uh, because God spent a long time, over thousands of years, revealing to us the specifics concerning his desire to restore the theocracy to the earth. And so you have to trace these things out in the order that God revealed them. So that's why we started with Eden. We went to the Abrahamic covenant. Eden, I'm a young earth creationist, so I believe the Garden of Eden scenario was about 4,000 B.C. And from there we went to Abraham. That's 2000 B.C. And then from there we went to number three, six centuries forward to about 1500 B.C. And now God reveals to the nation of Israel the Mosaic Covenant, which introduces a condition. There's no conditions in the Abrahamic Covenant, but there is a condition in the Mosaic Covenant. And the condition doesn't give Israel ownership of her blessings, but gives her what? Anybody remember? Possession. 
or enjoyment. And once Israel enjoys what she owns, the kingdom of God comes to the earth. And of course, the Mosaic Covenant points to who? Points to Jesus. They know him as Yeshua. But the whole kingdom, whether it's going to come to the earth or not, is not riding on the shoulders of the church. It's riding on the shoulders of Israel's response to the condition in the Mosaic Covenant, which is ultimately to enthrone the king of God's own choosing. So from there, we move to number four, and this is what we're going to develop here in this particular session. It has to do with the theocracy's departure. So one of the things I alluded to last night, you might recall, is, is God established this office of theocratic administrator in Eden. It was lost at the fall of man. But it was restored in a very limited sense, God ruling over a man who was ruling for God. It was restored in a limited sense at the time of Moses. So God is ruling Moses, and Moses is governing Israel. So that's sort of a restoration in a limited sense of the office of theocratic administrator, not over the whole earth, as was the case with Adam in Eden, but over a tiny nation, uh, the nation of Israel. And that office is going to continue through the judges. God is ruling Israel through judges. And then following the judges' era, that office is going to continue on through the kings as God is ruling the nation of Israel through various kings. And I'm going to show you in this session how that office completely disappeared from the earth and Israel entered a very important time period that Israel is still in now, as I speak, in the year 2020, called the Times of the Gentiles. So you have the Office of Theocratic Administrator, Genesis 1, lost Genesis 3, but restored in a limited sense in the time of Moses. And that may be why Paul... In Romans chapter 5, verse 14, talks about death reigning from Adam until Moses. And a lot of people are kind of perplexed by that. Why does he single out the era between Adam and Moses? And I think he singles that out because that's the time period where there is no theocratic administrator at all. But it gets restored in a limited sense in the time of Moses, and that office will continue on right up until the eve of the Babylonian captivity, which we'll talk about in just a minute. So Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6, which is when the Mosaic Covenant was entered into by God with Israel at Mount Sinai. You'll notice the word kingdom there. And so based on that word, uh, I think that's pretty good grounds for the restoration of the office of theocratic administrator in a limited sense. And this is where the Lord entered into with Israel the suzerain vassal treaty. Remember that? We talked about that last night. And the suzerain vassal treaty has within it blessings and curses, blessings for obedience Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 through 14, and curses for disobedience, Deuteronomy 28, verses 15 through 68. So from the time of Moses onward, that treaty is in effect. And God is going to evaluate theocratic administrators based on whether they follow the covenant text, which is the Ten Commandments ultimately, and in essence, adhere to their part of the treaty. That determines whether Israel is blessed or cursed. That's why when you go through the book of Kings, 1 Kings and 2 Kings, I mean, why are those books called the books of 1 and 2 Kings? Because it's all about a bunch of kings, right? We have uh, in the southern kingdom, uh, in the northern kingdom, what were there, 20 kings, if I'm not mistaken? Uh, maybe there was 19, in the southern kingdom, 20. I uh, may have those backwards, but 
what you'll notice as you go through the kings is it says this king was good, this king was bad. This king was good, this king was bad. This king was good, this king was bad. I mean, why does it keep saying that? Is it because one is a Republican and the other is a Democrat? Um, one keeps the interest rates low, the other one doesn't. One keeps the economy humming, the other one doesn't. No, they're all evaluated based on whether they're adhering to the covenant text in the suzerain vassal treaty. So they're being evaluated as theocratic uh, administrators. So the first king of the United Kingdom, as you know, was a man named Saul. Uh, not the best choice for the nation because the kings are supposed to come from which tribe? Judah. Saul came from which tribe? He came from Benjamin. So that should have been a clue right there that they were you know, going the wrong direction. But they didn't want to wait on the Lord. If they had waited on the Lord, they could have had David. But they were attracted to Saul's appearance. Uh, they're walking by sight and not by faith. That's why in 1 Samuel 16, God is very clear that he doesn't evaluate people on the basis of outer appearance, but on the basis of what? On the basis of the heart. But the nation wanted Saul. He was from the wrong tribe. You know, that's why the New Testament says don't lay hands too hastily on somebody. I've watched churches go down the wrong road constantly. They're so desperate to find a pastor that they'll just take anybody. And they don't wait on God's timing and they get a Saul when they could have waited on the Lord and had a David. But we don't like to wait on the Lord, right? We like things to be done on our schedule. Uh, I often pray, Lord, give me patience and give it to me right now, you know, kind of thing. So they had Saul. And Saul is the first king of the United Kingdom. He rules for 40 years. He's followed by Solomon. I'm sorry, David. David rules for 40 years, and then he's followed by Solomon, and he rules for 40 years. So each of the first three kings of the nation of Israel are governing the nation for 40-year increments. Saul reigned, I think, from about 1051 to 1011. Uh, David from 1011 to 971. And then Solomon from 971 to 931. And you have to understand that all the way through those reigns, the, the suzerain vassal treaty is still in effect. Uh, Israel is either blessed or cursed based on what the theocratic administrator does concerning the covenant text. So whether the nation is going to go through a difficult time or a prosperous time is totally dependent on whether the king is going to obey the covenant text or not. So by the time you get to Solomon, the third king of the United Kingdom who ruled from, you know, 971 to 931 BC, you know, give or take, it's almost like Solomon at the end of his life, when you study it, it's like he woke up one morning, looked at the Mosaic covenant and decided to do the exact opposite. Um, there's a provision in there about how a king, you see this in Deuteronomy 17, how a king is under the law, not over the law. Now, last night I made reference to the fact that the most frequently quoted book by America's founding fathers was the Bible. Did you know that? Uh, four times more of any of their original citations come from the Bible. And of the Bible, what was their favorite book, remember? It was the book of Deuteronomy. They quoted from it more frequently than anything else. And in Deuteronomy 17, there's the principle that the king is under the law. The king is not over the law. The king is under the law. And that's very different than the other cultures of the time period who worship their kings as deities and put them over the law rather than under the law. And so there's a provision in there that Deuteronomy 17, that the king is not to multiply for himself wealth. In fact, rather than me trying to summarize it, just 
take your Bible and hold your place here in Daniel 2 and just travel back with me for a minute to Deuteronomy 17, verses 14 through 17. It says, When you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you and you possess the land and live in it, I will set over you a uh, a a king over me, I will set a king over me like all the nations around me. In other words, that's what the nation's going to say. Then verse 15, we covered last night, you shall not set a king over you whom the Lord, your, let me see, I'm having a hard time reading with the light here. Let me try that again. You shall surely set over you a king whom the Lord your God, there we go, look at that, let there be light. God chooses one from among your own countrymen. You shall set a king over yourselves. You may not put a foreigner over yourselves who is not of your countrymen. Moreover, he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor shall he uh, cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses since the Lord has said to you, you shall never again return that way. He shall not multiply wives for himself. Look at that. Or else his heart will turn away, nor shall he be, nor, let's see, nor shall he greatly increase silver and gold for himself. So it's very clear that according to the Suzerain Vassal Treaty that the king is not over the law, the king is under the law, the king is not a deity, even though he may have graduated from Harvard. He's not smarter than everybody. He's to be one of you. And this is an ancient principle in the legal system, American legal system, called the Lex Rex principle. It comes from Samuel Rutherford in 1644, a Presbyterian minister who basically said, Look, kings are not gods. Kings are under the law just like the rest of us are. And Samuel Rutherford in Europe taught a man uh, named John Witherspoon. You ever heard that name? John Witherspoon came to the United States and he started a school called the College of Princeton or College of New Jersey, which ultimately became Princeton. And guess who uh, he taught? He taught men like James Madison, uh, the father of our Constitution, etc. And so that's why, and by the way, where did Samuel Rutherford get this idea that the king is under the law but not over the law? Well, he was a Presbyterian minister in Edinburgh, I think. And he got it from the book of Deuteronomy. So that's why within the American system, it's this idea that a king is not, or a ruler is not greater than anybody else. He's just one of us. And so they, you know, said a president can only serve a certain number of terms later on in American history, and those that rule over us are accountable to us through the ballot box. So this is the Lex Rex principle, and it's a principle that you can trace right back to the Bible. In fact, you can trace it from the Bible into the United States Constitution. And so the Suzerain Vassal Treaty was very clear that a king can't just do whatever he wants to do. He's under the law just like everybody else. And so that's why when you go through the book of 1 Kings and 2 Kings, it says this one was good, this one was bad, this one was good, this one was bad. And they're being evaluated by whether they're putting themselves under the law or over the law. I mean, look at what David did in terms of adultery and murder. He just put himself over the law. And all his troubles can be traced to him violating Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 17, because he just breached God's covenant. You see that? So Solomon, the third king of the United Kingdom, wakes up one day, and it's almost like he read this, Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 17, and just did the opposite. Don't multiply wives for yourself. What did Solomon do? He multiplied wives for himself. He had 700 wives, if I remember right, and 300 concubines. 
And by the way, when you entered into a treaty with a foreign nation, part of the deal was you got the princess. So the fact that he has all of these wives and all of these concubines indicates that he violated another principle in the Bible where God says over and over again, make no treaty with the pagans. Now that also is part of the American system because a president can't enter into a treaty with a foreign power without a two-thirds supermajority ratification vote in the Senate. So our, and George Washington in his farewell address said we shouldn't be entangled with foreign powers. Be very wary of treaties. And all of that comes from our founding fathers, I believe, studying the book of Deuteronomy. So my point is Solomon is putting himself over the law. He's multiplying wives, which means he's involving himself in all of these treaties. Uh, He's multiplying wealth for himself. In fact, that's why it says at the end of Solomon's life, 1 Kings chapter 11, his many wives led him astray from the Lord. Remember where it says that? Why, Why does it keep saying that? Because he's entering into these treaties with all of these foreign powers, violating God's law, and he's getting the princess as part of the deal, and they're bringing into the land of Israel their paganism. So every single king gets into trouble because they violate the Lex Rex principle. Kind of like uh, Ahab, remember that? Who wanted Naboth's vineyard, remember that story? And he demanded that the vineyard be sold to him, and sorry, it's not for sale, and he went home and sulked. Why did he sulk? Because the king is under the law. There's, There's such a thing as private property rights. If if the vineyard's not for sale, it's not for sale, the king can't grab it. And that's where his wife, uh, Jezebel, who was not from the land of Israel, she was from where? She was Phoenician, wasn't she? And she, it was a mixed marriage. See, when when you evaluate leaders politically or even in the church, you better look at their wives because the wife is going to have a lot of influence, good or bad, over that particular leader. And so she started to ridicule him. She says, what kind of king are you? Uh, Where I come from, kings just do whatever they want to do. And he said to his wife, you know, you're right. And he went and he just violated God's law, violated uh, private ownership of property, and he just took the vineyard. And that is cited in the book of 1 Kings, I think 2 Kings also, about one of the reasons why you have the Assyrians coming and dispersing the northern kingdom in 722 B.C. So every single king gets into trouble because they put themselves over God's law. And that's what Solomon did. He multiplied wives, he entered into treaties that he shouldn't have entered into, and he accumulated massive wealth for himself, all in direct violation of Deuteronomy 17, verses 14 through 17. And every king thinks they can do this and get away with it, but God keeps a record of it because Israel is bound by the suzerain vassal treaty since the time of Moses. And part of that treaty is blessings for obedience and curses for what? Disobedience. So consequently, when Solomon leaves the throne in 931 B.C., 1 Kings chapter 12, the kingdom of Israel is divided. The division of the kingdom is a direct consequence to what Solomon did at the end of his life. And so what happens from that point on, from 1 Kings 12 on, is the division of the land of Israel between the ten tribes up north that took on the name Israel and two tribes down south that took on the name what? Judah. And so the the kingdom is divided at this point and the northern tribes continue in their rebellion against God. Uh, All of the kings uh, 
I think there were 19 of them. They didn't have one good king up north. I mean, if your team goes 0-19, you're not having the best season ever, for sure. And so, consequently, God brings the Assyrians against the north in 722 B.C. to disperse them. And why did God do that? Because that's what God said he would do in the suzerain vassal treaty going back to the time of Moses. Remember how the curses would just accumulate and they would reach a zenith and the zenith would be a pagan power will come against you and displace you from your own land. God is 700 years later not doing anything he didn't tell them about. 700 years later in the time of Moses. 700 years earlier rather than the time of Moses. Remember what God said there at Sinai. The Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth as the eagle swoops down, a nation whose language you shall not understand, a nation of fierce countenance. Look at this. Who will show no respect for the old nor show favor to the young. That's how you always recognize paganism. It declares war on the most vulnerable members of society, which would be who? The young and the old. Now, if that's the standard, how are we doing today in the United States with that? Well, we have a war on the unborn through abortion. We have a war on the elderly through euthanasia and things of that nature. But that's how paganism always operates. It always declares war legally, on the most vulnerable groups, the very groups that God's always looking out for. Because God says over and over in his word, he takes care of the widows, he takes care of the orphans. Paganism wants to blot out those two groups. And so a pagan power is going to come against you whose language you don't know, who will show no respect for the old or the young, and that is exactly what happened to the northern kingdom in 722 B.C., at the hands of the Assyrians, 2 Kings 17, you could read all about it, and the north is dispersed at that point in time. The north, as I said before, had 19 kings, all of them were bad. Now the south did a little better. They have 20 kings, and eight of them are good. Why are they good? Because at least eight of them tried to honor the covenant text in some form or substance. So God, for whatever reason, always showed a little bit more grace to the southern kingdom than he did the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom is dispersed. The southern kingdom was taken into captivity. The southern kingdom lasted about 136 years longer than the northern kingdom before their time of discipline came. Now, so there's a little bit more grace for the south than there was the north. Now, why did God show a little bit more grace to the south than he did the north? The answer is in Genesis 49, verse 10. For at the end of his life, Jacob predicted that the Messiah is going to come from which tribe? the tribe of Judah. Where is Judah? Not in the north, but in the south. So God can't allow the south to completely be eradicated because there's a Messiah that's got to be born through the south. They've got to be preserved somehow, some way. So that explains why the north is dispersed, but the south is taken into Babylonian captivity and why the south lasted a little bit longer than the north before the time of discipline came and why there are no good kings at all in the north, but at least there are eight good kings in the south. There's a little bit more grace for the south. But discipline has to come if they continue in their disobedience because of the suzerain vassal treaty, entered into at the time of Moses, blessings for obedience, curses for disobedience. And, you know, you would think that the south would have learned her lesson But the prophet Ezekiel, I think in Ezekiel 23, talks about two sisters, uh, Ohola and Oholabah. And one is the older sister, one is the younger sister. 
um, one of the sisters represented the northern kingdom. And she became harlotress. And she went into judgment. Now, you would think that the other sister would have learned her lesson and stayed away from harlotry. In other words, you would have thought the southern kingdom would have said, wow, look at how God brought discipline on the north and we're going to adhere to the covenant text and we're not going to move into idolatry. But in fact, the latter sister became more harlotrous than the former. And you'll read all of this in Ezekiel 23. Uh, Ezekiel 23, I would call Christian pornography because it's very, very sexually graphic. And I remember saying this in one of my classes and all the students all of a sudden started to flip over there. Oh, wow. You know, they got really interested in that chapter of the Bible. But it's very sexually graphic depic- depicting harlotry. So, you know, you run into people and they want to ban pornography, and I'm, I'm in favor of that, but I'm always thinking, well, we've got to be careful because I want to keep Ezekiel 23 in my Bible, so let's be careful about what we're saying about banning, banning pornography because it's very pornographic what's said there, particularly when you read it in Hebrew. And uh, Ezekiel's point is, you know, you would think one sister would learn the lesson from what happened to the other sister, but she didn't. And she became worse than the first sister. And that's what happened to the South. Ezekiel is using this metaphorically. The South has become not just as promiscuous as the North, but more promiscuous. And so therefore, how can judgment be, um, how can judgment be averted? So judgment is coming, but at the same time, God shows a little bit more grace to the South. One of the reasons he showed a little bit more grace to the south is because of the Davidic covenant. The Messiah must come from whose lineage? David's. David was from which tribe? Judah. Judah was in the north or the south? Judah was within the south. But nevertheless, 722 happened. The north is swept away. The south did not learn her lesson. She became more idolatrous than the north. And so God says, to quote that great theologian, Yogi Berra, it's deja vu all over again. The cycle of discipline is about to start all over again. And this time God is going to bring a foreign king against the south, not from Assyria, but from Babylon. And so the south is taken into Babylonian captivity in the year 586 B.C. And you can read about all about it in 2 Kings chapter 25. And it is at that point, just prior to the Babylonian captivity, that the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 8 through 11, records the Shekinah glory leaving the temple. Now you remember that Solomon built the temple. David was not allowed to build the temple by God because David was a man of war. He had blood on his hands. Solomon was a man of peace. In fact, in the world... I should have turned that off before I readjust it. Can you guys still hear me? That's what happens when you get too animated. You start knocking over cords and things like that. In fact, in the name Solomon, you'll recognize the word shalom. You recognize that word? What does that word mean in Hebrew? Basically means peace. So Solomon was allowed to build the temple. And you remember that when Solomon built the temple, the Shekinah glory of God entered the temple. And so the Shekinah glory of God had been in the temple from about 966 B.C. And I get that date from 1 Kings 6.1 all the way till 586 B.C., the eve of the Babylonian captivity. And just before Babylon came against the south, the Shekinah glory of God leaves the temple. And once the Shekinah glory of God leaves the temple, the office of theocratic administrator, 
which had been restored in a limited sense in the time of Moses completely leaves planet Earth. And the nation enters a time period called the Times of the Gentiles. The Times of the Gentiles is a time period where the Shekinah glory of God is not in the temple any longer. The nation of Israel is no longer governed by kings, but she is being trampled down by various Gentile powers. And it represents a time period after the last reigning king on David's throne, a man named Zedekiah, left the throne. And the times of the Gentiles will continue until Jesus takes his seat on David's throne in the millennial kingdom. And during that whole time period, the nation of Israel is being trampled down by various Gentile powers. And the office of theocratic administrator will not be on the earth from that time period when the Shekinah glory of God leaves until the Shekinah glory of God returns to the temple, in this case the millennial temple, during the thousand year reign of Christ. Um, I should make clear, if I could back up just for a minute, the division between the north and the south. The king of the, or the capital of the north was a city named Samaria. The capital of the south was a city named what? Jerusalem. So Samaria is gone. The north is gone, scattered by the Assyrians. The only thing left is the south. The south could have averted disaster if they had gone back to the covenant text, but they actually became more harlotrous, spiritually speaking, than the north. And what Ezekiel sees just prior to the Babylonian deportation, which God has to bring, if God doesn't bring it, then he's not faithful to what he said in the time of Moses as recorded in Deuteronomy 28, 49 and 50. I'm bringing against you a nation from afar, who will show no respect for the old or for the young. And so, just prior to that deportation, the Shekinah glory of God leaves the earth, and it won't return to the earth until the millennial kingdom, and everything in between is a time period when the kingdom is completely absent from the earth. Uh, It's basically called the times of the Gentiles. Where do we get that name, Times of the Gentiles, from? It's an expression that Jesus himself used in Luke 21, verse 24, when he says, They will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles. See that there? That's where the idea comes from, or the verbiage, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So what are the times of the Gentiles? It's the time period between the Shekinah glory of God leaving, just prior to the Babylonian deportation, and when the Shekinah glory of God will return in the millennial kingdom to the temple. It's a time period when the nation has no king reigning from David's throne. The last guy that reigned from David's throne was a man named Zedekiah, And after his reign was over and he was deposed by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, you don't have a king reigning on David's throne. There's no king reigning on David's throne today. And that's not going to change until Christ returns at the end of the seven-year tribulation period in fulfillment of the Davidic covenant and takes his seat on David's throne. So that whole time period is called the times of the Gentiles. No theocratic administrator on the earth whatsoever. Hosea predicted this time would come. He says, for the sons of Israel will remain many days without king or prince. And that's basically what's been going on since the time of the Babylonian deportation. Israel has no king. She has no Shekinah glory of God in her temple. And she's basically being bullied by various Gentile pagan powers. 
Now, that was my introduction. How do you like that? That was a 39-minute introduction. <laughs> um, that's why I had you turn to Daniel 2. Because Daniel 2 is the prophet that God raises up towards the beginning of the Babylonian captivity to explain this mystery or this new time period that the nation of Israel had entered into. Nebuchadnezzar, you'll recall, of Babylon had a dream and he tells his soothsayers, I'm not going to give you the dream for you to interpret. You tell me what the dream was. How would you like that as a job description? And then after you tell me what the dream was, then tell me what it means. And no one can come up with an answer except Daniel. Because Daniel turned to God. And only God could provide an answer like this. So God reveals to Daniel this dream that Nebuchadnezzar had of this giant, dazzling, beautiful statue. It had a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. And what it represents are the various Gentile powers that are going to have the upper hand against the nation of Israel during the times of the Gentiles. Daniel sees all of this back in the 6th century and he's able to look down prophetically through the corridors of time and he's able to see what empires are going to trample Israel down during the times of the Gentiles. The head of gold would represent Babylon that would trample the nation of Israel down from 605 to 539 B.C. And you can see in parenthesis all of the Bible verses where you find this. The chest and arms of silver would represent the Medo-Persian Empire that would trample the nation of Israel down from 539 to 331 B.C. The belly and thighs of bronze would represent Greece that would trample the nation of Israel down from 331 to 63 B.C., the two legs of iron would represent Rome. It's amazing that Daniel saw this so many centuries in advance. That would trample the nation of Israel down from 63 BC up until the time when Rome pushed Israel out of her land 40 years after the time of Christ, AD 70. And there's probably two legs there because most people historically understand that Rome had two divisions, the Eastern Division and the Western Division. And then, as is so common in prophecy, Daniel's vision, or the vision that God gave to Daniel, sort of leapfrogs, in this case, at least 2,000 years, skips the church age, which we haven't even talked about yet, the age of time that we're in now, and goes to a time period after the church is no longer on the earth and begins to describe what many call a revived Roman Empire. So in between the ankles and the feet is a time period there of at least 2,000 years that Daniel couldn't see. And you say, well, this is really weird. Well, this is actually sort of common in prophecy. It's very common for the Holy Spirit to present two events in a back-to-back -back fashion without revealing the vast amount of time in between the events. I mean, this is on all of our cards at Christmas, isn't it? For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. Is that the first coming or the second coming of Christ? That's the first coming. And then second part of verse 6 says the government will rest upon its shoulders. Verse 7 says there will be no increase, uh, no end to the increase of his government, of peace, etc. Is that first coming or second coming? Second coming. So Isaiah just gave two back-to-back -back visions. One the first coming, one the second coming, without talking about the vast amount of time, at least 2,000 years, between those two comings. So it's sort of like prophets looking at uh, what I would call mountains in the distance, 
uh, the larger mountain, let's say, is behind the smaller mountain. And so you can sort of see the larger mountain raised up. But what you cannot see is the valley between the mountains. That's basically how Old Testament prophets function many times. This was why Peter tells us in 1 Peter 1, verses 10 and 11, that the prophets were confused about their own prophecies. You know, Daniel, many times, particularly in Daniel 12, wanted to understand what it is that God had just revealed to him, and he was told to go his way. It's not, it's not for you to understand. Isaiah couldn't make sense of his own prophecies because he would receive one vision from the Lord about a suffering Messiah and another vision from the Lord about a ruling and reigning Messiah, and he would say, well, which is it? And that's why a lot of folks way back then thought there were going to be two Messiahs. There was going to be Ben Joseph, who would suffer, and Ben David, who would rule. But hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Uh, we can look back and say, well, that, that one over there is the first coming. This one over here is the second coming. But poor Isaiah didn't have the vantage point of history. And so 1 Peter 1, 10 and 11 tells us that he was confused about his own prophecies. But anyway, you get to the ankles, and it jumps about 2,000 years from the time of ancient Rome up until what we call revived Rome. And the feet of iron and clay would represent some kind of empire from the, arising from the Antichrist that many call a revived Roman Empire. Uh, I personally think it's much broader than ancient Rome because Daniel 7 verse 23 says it's going to cover the whole earth. So it's the new world order. Uh, it's the one world system of the Antichrist arising from the cultural inheritance of ancient Rome. And that's what the feet of iron and clay represent. And then Daniel, at the very end of this whole thing, sees this stone cut without human hands. Now, what would that stone be? That's the kingdom, which is what this class is about. It comes and it cataclysmically shatters the feet of the statue and the whole thing immediately crumbles. And the stone cut without human hands grows and grows and grows till it fills the whole earth. And that is a representation of the kingdom of God being restored to the earth. At that point, the Shekinah glory of God will re-enter the millennial temple, Ezekiel 40 through 46, roughly, talks about it. The office of theocratic administrator will be restored, and what was lost in Eden is restored at that point. But it's very important to understand this, because the Holy Spirit in Daniel 2 is giving us a chronology. The kingdom will not be established on this earth. It doesn't matter how many churches put it in their vision statement. It doesn't matter how many prayers we pray and, and how many emails we sign that we're bringing in the kingdom and doing kingdom work. It doesn't matter how many conferences that we attend called Kingdom Builders Conferences. The fact of the matter is the kingdom will not materialize on planet Earth until the Antichrist Empire, which is being built right now, wouldn't you say? I think COVID-19 is a big step down that uh, road. The whole world is under global control right now. I mean, to me, it's preparatory for the one world system that humanity is destined to go into. But not until that whole one world system runs its course, the Antichrist comes on the scene and rules at least for three and a half years, and these are the events of the tribulation period, not until that whole structure reaches its height and is instantaneously shattered by Jesus Christ at the second advent, not until that happens can anybody say we're in the kingdom. You follow? 
So Daniel 2 is giving us a chronology of when the kingdom will come. He's not just telling us what the kingdom's going to be like. He's telling us when to expect it. Don't expect it until the Antichrist empire reaches its zenith and is cataclysmically overthrown by Jesus Christ himself. And so that's the manifestation of the kingdom, Daniel 2, verses 44 and 45. Now watch this very carefully. Daniel 2 through 7 is one of the few sections of the Old Testament not written in Hebrew, but written in Aramaic. Chapter 1, Hebrew. Chapters 8 through 12, Hebrew. Chapters 2 through 7, Aramaic. So therefore, 2 through 7 must form some sort of literary pattern. And they fit into a pattern called a chiasm, which is a strange way of thinking by Western standards, but it was a very common way of communicating in the ancient Near East. What is said in chapter 2 is repeated in chapter 7. Those are the outer edges. And you move a little bit inward into the chiasm, and what is said in chapter 3 is repeated in chapter 6. And then you move a little bit more inward, and what is said in chapter 4 is repeated in chapter 5. So chapter 2 and 7 deal with the same subject, the times of the Gentiles. Chapters 3 and 6 deal with the same subject, civil disobedience, which is something God's people need to know about because they were living in Babylon when this vision was given. They weren't, they weren't in their homeland anymore. So when is it right to tell the civil authorities no? I mean, when the civil authorities say don't go to church and don't sing, when is it right to say no? So I think we need to be studying Daniel 3 and 6 in our time. Would you not agree with that? Chapters 4 and 5 deal with revelation to a Gentile king. The revelation is given to um, Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4, and it's given to his son Belshazzar in chapter 5. Chapter 4 is Nebuchadnezzar becoming prideful and becoming insane for seven years. Chapter 5 is the handwriting on the wall. So what I want you to see is 2 and 7 are teaching the same truth. If chapter 2 is about the times of the Gentiles, then what do you think chapter 7 is about? The same subject, times of the Gentiles. And this is when Daniel sees, this time, not a beautiful statue but four disgusting beasts. A lion, a bear, a leopard. I feel like Dorothy there in The Wizard of Oz. A lion, a bear, a leopard, then a terrifying beast. And then he sees this beast having ten horns. The ten horns correlate with the ten toes of the Antichrist empire in Daniel 2. So the lion would correlate with the head of gold, which represents Babylon, the first empire to trample Israel down during the times of the Gentiles. The bear would correlate with the chest and arms of silver, which would represent Medo-Persia, the second empire to trample down Israel during the times of the Gentiles. The leopard would correlate with the belly and thighs of bronze, which would represent Greece, the third empire to trample down Israel during the times of the Gentiles. And then the legs of iron would correlate with the terrifying beast, which would represent Rome, the fourth empire to trample down Israel during the times of the Gentiles. Then Daniel skips at least 2,000 years, and he sees a revived Rome, And he sees uh, that terrifying beast having ten horns, which correlate with the ten toes of Daniel 2. And that's the one world system of the Antichrist, which will cover the whole world. Which we're told in these passages, the Antichrist will rule the world through through a ten nation. I think it's better said ten region or ten king confederacy. 
And only after that last beast with ten horns runs its course will the kingdom be given by the Ancient of Days to the Son of Man. So both Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 are giving a chronology. They're just describing it in different ways. And what they're both saying is do not expect the kingdom of God to materialize on planet Earth until the Antichrist empire runs its course yet future and is cataclysmically overthrown by Jesus Christ himself. So Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 are not just giving us an explanation of what the kingdom will be like when it comes, but they're actually revealing when the kingdom will come. Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 are very interesting when you study them. Daniel 2, it's a beautiful statue. Why is it beautiful and dazzling? Because it was a dream given to who? Nebuchadnezzar, originally. And to Nebuchadnezzar, it seemed like a great time period. Because he was doing the what? He was doing the trampling. Daniel, in Daniel 7, is given the vision first. And he he sees the exact same time period. But he sees it as disgusting beasts. Why is it that what is beautiful to Nebuchadnezzar is is disgusting to Daniel? Because Daniel sees it from a Jewish perspective where he is being trampled on. You see that? So the receiver in Daniel 2 is Nebuchadnezzar. The receiver in Daniel 7 is Daniel. Uh, Daniel 2 is from the position of the oppressor. Daniel 7 is from the position of the oppressee. Daniel 2 is a Babylonian perspective. Daniel 7 is a Hebrew perspective. One a Jewish perspective, another one a Gentile perspective. One a man-centered perspective, the other one a God-centered perspective. One is a statue, one is beasts, one is beautiful, one is grotesque. But based on the chiastic structure in the book of Daniel, both chapter 2 and chapter 7 are giving their chronology And they're revealing not just what the kingdom is going to be like, but when it's going to come. Don't expect the kingdom to ever come. Don't expect the kingdom to materialize until the times of the Gentiles run their course. The times of the Gentiles will not run their course until the Antichrist empire reaches its zenith and is cataclysmically overthrown by Jesus Christ. Then the kingdom will come. Then the office of theocratic administrator will be restored to the earth. Then the Shekinah glory of God will re-enter the temple. And everything in between, don't expect any form of the kingdom to exist. Don't expect a political kingdom and don't expect a spiritual kingdom. And if you can grasp this, you save yourself from so much insanity out there. Because all of these pastors and preachers and theologians and authors are trying to tell you that we're in the kingdom now in some form or substance. That's not what Daniel 2 says. Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 says the kingdom will be completely and totally absent from planet earth during the times of the Gentiles. And don't even think about the kingdom. Well, you might want to think about it. But don't expect the kingdom to come until the Antichrist empire comes first and Jesus cataclysmically overthrows the Antichrist empire. Think about this for a minute. You're sitting in a church and the pastor keeps talking about we're bringing in the kingdom through social justice or environmentalism or whatever. And the next kingdom on the horizon is the feet of iron and clay, which is the Antichrist kingdom. Whose kingdom is that pastor building? He's not building God's kingdom at all. He's building the devil's kingdom. And he doesn't even realize it. And most of Christianity doesn't realize it because they've never been taught this precise chronology you know, that I'm trying to develop in this particular lesson. 
There's a lot of people running around that are going to tell you that the stone cut without human hands came in the first century. And Jesus started a spiritual kingdom in the first century. J. Dwight Pentecost explodes that myth by explaining why Daniel 2, verses 44 through 45, has to be future. Christianity did not suddenly fill the whole earth instantaneously at the first coming of Christ. It took Paul several decades before the gospel even penetrated Rome. Christ never destroyed the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire continued to function centuries after Christ left the earth. There, were no, there was no ten-king confederacy covering the whole earth in the time of Christ. By the way, Christ in the first coming was not a smiting stone. He was a stumbling stone. He's called in the book of Ephesians a cornerstone, but never a smiting stone. He's the smiting stone, not in his first coming, but in his what? Second coming. Beyond that, Christ did not destroy all the kingdoms of the world. I mean, the stone cut without human hands is going to destroy all the kingdoms of the earth and grow till it fills the whole earth. Jesus did no such thing in his first coming. And also, we're not in a political kingdom now. The church is not a political kingdom. The church is a spiritual man, a spiritual body of believers will we'll develop the church later on, dispersed throughout the earth. We, we're not represented by one country. I know that's difficult for Americans to accept because we think God is American, right? But the fact of the matter is Christianity is spread all over the world by the design of God. So we're not a political kingdom in that sense. So here's my last slide. Merrill Unger writes, how futile for conservative scholars to ignore that fact. What fact? The chronology that we just developed. From Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, explaining not just what the kingdom is, but when it will come. How futile for conservative scholars to ignore that fact and to seek to find a fulfillment of those prophecies, the stone cut without human hands, in history or in the church, when those predictions refer to events yet future and have no application whatsoever to the church. So I wanted to take you through that lesson because if you understand the times of the Gentiles, now you're starting to understand the chronology that God has in terms of when he will bring his kingdom to the earth. And you start to see how silly it is for us to try to do it now when God has given us a specific timing. Has anything I said made any sense at all? All right, that's the grace of God. Let's take a 10-minute break and we'll come back after that.